no form of government lasts forever. We've seen so many countries in the world that were democracies that no longer are democracies. I think we foolhardy to believe that the United States is somehow resistant to the forces that have undermined democracy elsewhere. What caused me to write the book is a belief that no matter what happens in the November elections, there are serious threats to American democracy that we have to deal with. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Everyone doing okay this evening? I'm Gloria Duffy, the president and CEO, or co-president and CEO now, of Commonwealth Club World Affairs, the merged organization of Commonwealth Club and World Affairs. And welcome to this evening's program. Uh, we've got a very provocative topic, uh, handled extremely well in his new book by Dean Chemerinsky. And it's gonna be a very interesting discussion. It's my, now my pleasure to introduce the distinguished guest to my right. Erwin Chemerinsky is the Dean of the University of California Berkeley School of Law and author of No Democracy Lasts Forever. Now that is a provocative title. How the Constitution Threatens the United States. He is a noted legal scholar. Uh, Dean Chemerinsky has authored more than 200 law review articles. He served as the former president of the Association of American Law Schools. Dean Chemerinsky, welcome back to the club. Congratulations on your new book. And thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Truly my honor and pleasure to be here. And we also are very grateful to Dean Chemerinsky, who moderates programs at the club sometimes. He plays my role when we have uh, topics related to the law and government and history and other topics. So we appreciate that. So this is a very uh, provocative title. Um, tell us what you mean by no democracy lasts forever. Well, literally, that's true. No form of government lasts forever. We've seen so many countries in the world that were democracies that no longer are democracies. I think we foolhardy to believe that the United States is somehow resistant to the forces that have undermined democracy elsewhere. What caused me to write the book is a belief that no matter what happens in the November elections, there are serious threats to American democracy that we have to deal with. The Greek city-states, the Greek city-states as the origin of democracy, it seems like democracy has lasted for a very long time. Well, democracy as a concept has been there since the Greek city-states, but in terms of individual countries, there are so many that were democracies and aren't. And we can think of major countries in the world, Hungary, Poland, India, which have really become much more repressive, much more authoritarian. And I see a crisis in the United States in part because of the loss of confidence in American government. The Pew Research Institute does a survey each year measuring confidence in government. The high water mark was in 1964 where 77% of those surveyed expressed confidence in government. When it was done last October, it was 20%. Another survey said, only 4% believed that American government is working well. And one of the things that's frightening to me is that among younger individuals, those we think in their 20s and the 30s, they're even much more skeptical about democracy. I saw an opinion poll last month that only 16, and maybe 16 people, and not 16%, it's just approval of Congress. The Supreme Court has its lowest approval ratings ever. Is there really confidence among any of us that our government can solve the key problems like climate change or income inequality? And at the same time, our country is more deeply divided, more polarized than it's been since Reconstruction. So I believe you identify the age of the Constitution as its key liability, 1787, a child of its times. Tell us about what specific problems you see in the way the Constitution was constructed, how they don't enable it to be the living document that we hope it will be today. 
And you've identified what the thesis of the book is, the choices were made in drafting the Constitution that are very much contributing to today's crisis of democracy. And for various reasons, these choices made then have become much more salient and problematic now. Give an example, the Electoral College. It's always been a terrible way to choose a president. I think I can show you that it was intended because the framers were deeply distrustful of the majority in society. It was intended as a way to protect the political power of states that had large enslaved populations. But as you know, never in the 20th century did the loser of the popular vote become president because of electoral college. In this century, though, it's happened twice, in 2000 and 2016. It almost happened in 2004. If John Kerry had won Ohio, he would have been chosen as president by the electoral college despite losing the popular vote. And in 2020, if 42,000 votes had been different in just three states, Donald Trump would have become president even though he lost the popular vote by seven million people. Because of population shifts and partisan realignment, it's quite likely that the Electoral College for the foreseeable future has a significant chance of picking as president the person who lost the popular vote. Can I give one more example oh, of the book? please. I know you have a, a, lot of a laundry list. Take the United States Senate. At the time the Constitution was written, the difference between the largest state, Virginia, and the smallest state, Delaware, was 12 to 1 in population. Now the difference between the largest state, California, and Wyoming, the smallest state, is 68 to 1. You can't reconcile they're both having two senators by any notion of democracy. And of course, it also matters for the Electoral College because the state's electors is the sum of its senators and representatives. I'll give a statistic that shows what this means. In the last session of Congress, there were 50 Democratic senators and 50 Republican senators. The 50 Democratic senators represented almost 45 million more people than the 50 Republican senators. And this all made worse because of the filibuster. We all have an image of the filibuster based on Jimmy Stewart and Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Well, the filibuster rules were changed in the 1970s, so no longer does somebody have to hold the floor of the Senate to do a filibuster. It's to allow the Senate to do its work even though somebody's declared a filibuster. So now it takes 60 votes to pass any legislation other than budget legislation. So a small number of senators representing a small percentage of the population can block any legislation. And that contributes to cynicism about government. It contributes to why our government isn't succeeding and can't deal with the problems of today. So just to elaborate a little further, you mentioned the virtual filibuster. Right. Could you explain how that works? Sure. As I alluded to a moment ago, it used to be that a filibuster required that a senator stand at the lectern and hold it until he collapsed or someone took over. This limited the number of filibusters. The Senate in the 1970s changed the rules. Now, no one has to hold the floor. Now it doesn't stop the work of the Senate. The Senate just continues on doing all of its other business, and somebody just has to declare that they wish to filibuster, and then it takes 60 votes cloture to end that filibuster. That is the virtue. The Senate gets to do all of its other work while the filibuster is happening, but it has the downside that it's now so easy to engage in a filibuster, and the practical effect, as I'm sure you know, except for budget legislation, anything else in terms of legislation takes 60 votes. And as I say, that really contributes to the inability of government to solve our problems today. I want to remind you, send up your questions. And those watching online, put them in the YouTube chat. Thanks. So your argument is that each decade since the 1960s, there have been events and uh, developments that have further rendered the Constitution dysfunctional. So. If we can go through the decades, just briefly, in the 1960s, demographics, other changes, can you describe those um, evolutions that have, in the 60s, that uh, challenged the Constitution? Well, I especially focus 
with regard to the Electoral College, there was a major partisan realignment that occurred in the 1960s. As you know, the New Deal coalition that had existed since Franklin Delano Roosevelt began to break down in 1964 with a handful of southern states voting for the Republican candidate, Barry Goldwater. And then President Nixon's southern strategy transformed the country in terms of the presidential electoral map, with the southern states becoming solidly red and ever more so since. At the same time, there's been a substantial population realignment with far more people now living in major urban areas. The result of that is to very much increase the electoral college being undemocratic. And that's why in this century, we've already had two instances of the electoral college choosing the candidate who lost the popular vote two more times that it can happen. And it's likely to continue to happen so long as we have the electoral college. 1970s, what changed? Some rules changes? Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, the Senate changed the rules of the filibuster there were a number of changes with regard to the rules, all of which was to make it much easier for there to be a filibuster, all of which led to, as I said, now it takes literally 60 votes to pass any legislation other than budget legislation. I'll give real world examples. In the prior session of Congress, the House of Representatives passed major voting rights legislation. It would have overcome some of the Supreme Court decisions that gutted the Voting Rights Act. It would have done a great deal more to protect the ability of everyone to vote. It would have dealt with other problems I can talk about with regard to voting. The reason it didn't get adopted was the filibuster in the Senate by Republican senators. On to the 1980s. Gerrymandering. Right. Um, when you think about the institutions created by the Constitution, the one that was meant to be democratic was the United States House of Representatives. However, what's changed, especially since the 1980s, is that partisan gerrymandering has become far more effective than ever before. Partisan gerrymandering, who is a political party that controls the legislature, draws election districts to maximize say, seats for that party. It's nothing new. It takes its name from a governor in Massachusetts, early in American history, Elbridge Geary. But what's changed is because of sophisticated computer programs and detailed voter analysis, it's possible to engage in partisan gerrymandering with far more precision than ever before. Take North Carolina as an example. It's a purple state. It went for Obama in 2008, Romney in 2012, Trump in the last two elections, but always very close. Trump beat Biden in 2020 in North Carolina by 1.35%. But the Republicans in North Carolina controlled the legislature, and they said their goal was to draw election maps so as to give Republicans 10 of 13 seats in Congress in North Carolina. They ran through a computer 3,000 different maps. They chose the map with districts most likely to give the Republicans 10 of 13 seats. In both 2016 and 2018, Republicans and Democrats in North Carolina got almost exactly the same number of votes for seats for Congress. It surprised none of us that 10 of 13 seats nonetheless went to Republicans. I can show you the same thing in state after state. Unfortunately, in 2019, the United States Supreme Court said that federal courts can't hear challenges to partisan gerrymandering. This undermines democracy, it also undermines faith in democracy. So on to the 21st century. Media, technology, communications, politicization of SCOTUS. What, what's happened more recently? Of course, all of the above. Um, the Supreme Court has very much contributed to the problems of democracy in its decisions in the 21st century. I can mention few of these. Think of Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission where the Supreme Court in 2010 held that corporations have the right to spend unlimited amounts of money in election from corporate treasuries to get candidates elected or defeated. I can show you through opinion polls how much this has increased cynicism in government. It doesn't matter much for presidential elections, given all the money that's there, but political scientists have shown that especially in more low visibility elections, 
where money to gain name recognition makes a difference, corporations have gained undue influence in the political process. Or Shelby County versus Holder in 2013. I think of the Voting Rights Act as one of the most important federal laws adopted in my lifetime. A crucial provision of it, Section 5, said for jurisdictions with a history of race discrimination in voting, they need to get pre-approval, pre-clearance from the Attorney General for a change in their election practices. There are hundreds of instances of discriminatory election systems that were blocked by not getting pre-clearance. But the Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, struck down the requirements for pre-clearance. Immediately, North Carolina and Texas put in discriminatory laws that have been previously blocked. No jurisdiction any longer needs to get pre-clearance because of Shelby County versus Holder. And I mentioned Rucho versus Common Cause from 2019, where the court said that federal courts can't hear challenges to partisan gerrymandering. My point is that all of these decisions further the crisis in democracy that I see in the United States. So the crisis in democracy is that the downside of all of this? We are a less democratic society. What is the negative impact? What, what do you see the crisis as being? The negative impact is a government that's lost the confidence and faith of the people. Those were the statistics that I mentioned. The downside is it contributes to a society that's increasingly polarized. The downside is I don't think any of us believe that the government has the ability or likelihood of dealing with the enormous problems, ones that have to be faced, such as climate change, which may be existential for the planet. And I have to say, I um, work in the field of national security and defense policy. The fact that we can't, uh, Congress can't agree on a budget and we have a continuing resolution, think about that, funding the defense budget on a two or three month time horizon at all times, that is a, in my view, a real threat to our security. It both reflects the problems that I'm trying to describe and, of course, contributes to those problems because that in itself undermines the confidence that people have in government. How long can any government survive if it lacks the confidence of the people? And again, opinion polls show us that it's younger voters especially who have lost confidence and faith in the government. You even mentioned the possibility of secession. Can you, what, sure. what's the scenario you see there? I'm jumping now to the last chapter of the book. <laughs> and it's okay. I go through before I get there, my belief that everything that's broken can be fixed. And we can talk about the ways in which I think things can be fixed by statutes, by constitutional amendments, even a new constitution. But what happens if none of that occurs? What happens if we continue on our current path? That's what I try to address in the last chapter. Now, one possibility is we'll just continue to muddle along as we are. But as I look at the history of the world, I'm not confident that that will continue forever. Another possibility is drifting towards authoritarianism. I am very frightened, I say this in the book, at the way in which the Republican Party has embraced Viktor Orban from Hungary bringing him to speak at events in the United States, taking their events to Hungary. In fact, J.D. Vance has said very much that Viktor Orban is a role model in terms of what he's done for Hungary. It's possible that our country will drift towards authoritarianism. And I worry if there is a crisis, there's always a tendency towards authoritarianism, and it might increase that temptation. But what if none of that happens? Then I worry that there could be a real move to some form of secession. I want to be clear, and I say this explicitly, but I'm not advocating secession. I'm not saying I think secession is likely in the foreseeable future. But I'll make a prediction for you now, because it's for the near term. I predict to you that if Donald Trump wins in November, and there's a Republican House and a Republican Senate, we will see the most serious talk about secession that we've seen since the Civil War. Again, not that it's going to happen now. And the underlying question that I worry about is what unites us still greater than what divides us as a country. Now, secession doesn't have to take the form of a civil war. 
doesn't necessarily need to include violence. It could be a dramatic change in the nature of government. We could keep a national government for foreign policy and national security and devolve much more power to the states, something much more like the confederation that preceded the Constitution, something much more like what goes on in the European Union. As I say in the book, my hope is if people face these possibilities, staring at the abyss might make them more willing to take on what's necessary to reform government to deal with the crisis in democracy. So you have a to-do list uh, from this discussion and in your book, get rid of the electoral college, address gerrymandering, the filibuster, n no life tenure for Supreme Court justices, et cetera. How can these be addressed? Can they be addressed through reform, through amendments, through measures, partial measures like this? I start by saying much of the problem can be solved by statutes. You don't need to change the Constitution. Let me give examples. Congress by statute could eliminate winner take all in the Electoral College. Now everywhere except Maine and Nebraska, whoever wins the electoral votes of a state Gets, get the popular vote in the state, gets all the electoral votes in that state. So alas, if you're gonna vote for Donald Trump in California in November, it's as if you don't vote at all. If you vote for Kamala Harris in November in Texas, it's as if you don't vote at all. I can show that winner take all makes it much more likely that the loser of the popular vote can be chosen as president of the Electoral College. California isn't gonna ever eliminate winner take all on its own because it's unilateral disarmament. Why should it choose to give some of its electors to the Republican candidate if Texas isn't going to give some of its electors to the Democratic candidate? But Congress could do that for the entire country. The Senate could eliminate the filibuster entirely. It doesn't even take a statute. The Senate the filibuster is created by Senate rules, not by the Constitution or a statute. Congress could pass a law that would outlaw gerrymandering for congressional elections. It was part of a bill that passed the House in the last session. And I can go on with other things, but my point is there's so much that could be done by statutory change if there's the will to do so. Do you think it's likely that these problems will be fixed from legislation, judicial decisions? I don't think it will happen unless people advocate for it. And so my hope is that people will look at these and say, we need to make these changes. We need to lessen the impact of electoral college. We need to find ways of lessening the Senate being so anti-democratic. We need to eliminate partisan gerrymandering. And the interesting thing is, for some of these, there are overwhelming opinion polls supporting it. So when you see opinion polls, it's 75% you know, of people say partisan gerrymandering should be eliminated. That's why California adopted an independent commission to draw legislative districts, but we're just a handful of states that do so. So I think my answer to your question is, we've gotta recognize the problem and fight for the solution, and then it could happen. The Commonwealth Club actually had a little bit to do with creating that independent uh, commission in California to draw legislative districts, but that's another story. Um, if it doesn't happen statutorily, um, constitutional convention, some larger solution? Well, beyond what can be done by statute, almost everything I identify as a problem could theoretically be solved by a constitutional amendment. In theory, there could be a constitutional amendment to abolish the Electoral College. In theory, there could be a constitutional amendment that would outlaw gerrymandering. There could be a constitutional amendment to outlaw life tenure for Supreme Court justices. That's one where I actually believe it's plausible. I've just seen opinion polls again that show about three quarters of people believe that there should be term limits for Supreme Court justices. In the 2016 presidential Republican primaries, Ben Carson, Mike Huckabee, and Rick Perry, three Republican candidates, all argued for 18 year term limits for Supreme Court justices. And let me explain why I think this is a problem in terms of democracy. When the Constitution was written, the average life expectancy was 36 years. Thankfully, life expectancy is so much longer today. From 1787, when the Constitution was written, 
until 1970, the average tenure of a Supreme Court justice was 15 years, remarkably constant. For those who have been appointed since 1970 and have left the bench, the average tenure is 27 years. Think of Clarence Thomas. He was confirmed in 1991 when he was 43 years old. He's already been on the Supreme Court for 34 years. If he remains on the Supreme Court until he's 90, the age Justice John Paul Stevens retired, he'll be a justice for 47 years. Or think of Amy Coney Barrett. She was 48 when she was confirmed for the court in 2020. If she stays until she's 87, the age Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, Barrett will be a justice until the year 2059. This is just too much power in one person's hands for too long a period of time. But, as I say, I think a constitutional amendment is at least possible if we choose to work for it. But I also raise in the book what you say. Rather than have a lot of piecemeal amendments, is it time to start thinking about a new constitution? In some ways, it's absurd that we're governed in 2024 by a document that was written in 1787 for a very small agrarian society with enslaved people that occupied one coast in the country. Isn't it time? And at some point, it will be time to think about how do we draft a new constitution? In fact, the more the Supreme Court says that this constitution has to be interpreted to mean the same thing it did in 1787, the more absurd it becomes to be governed by that document. So let's say you have a constitutional convention. We know what's on your to-do list. There may be other folks with other perspectives who have a to-do list. What's the worst case of what could end up in our Constitution if we open it up? The worst case is whatever your worst nightmare is. On the other hand, remember, nothing will be adopted as a new Constitution unless it's approved. I suggest something that may seem radical. I think the proposal for the new Constitution should be put to the people for a vote. Those who would draft the new Constitution would know that whatever they propose has to be ratified. I think, I hope, that those in the role of drafting a new constitution would live up to their roles. That's what happened in 1787. It's not that those in Philadelphia in 1787 were divinely inspired. It's not that as a group they were more brilliant than anyone we have today. They lived up to the task that they assigned to themselves of drafting a new constitution. And I would hope if we have a constitutional convention today, the men and women there will realize that proposing something that's extreme in any direction just isn't going to adopt it, and that their legacy will then be impugned, that they want a document that can be adopted by the American people, and that's a check, and then ultimately it has to be ratified. And so that's what gives me hope, though there's a danger, but there's also a danger in doing nothing. How do you feel, how do you view Norway or Finland, not sure which one, a democracy where they, that they have amended 7,100 times? Is it the most healthy? One of the interesting things as I was researching about secession was if you look at the history of Norway and Sweden, the way Norway became a separate country was a largely peaceful secession. Again, I'm not arguing for secession, but it's interesting, I do talk about that country in the last chapter of the book. I think 7,100 amendments, if that number is right, is obviously too many. On the other hand, I think one of the flaws in our current Constitution is it was made too difficult to amend. In order to amend the Constitution through the only procedure that's been used so far, it takes two-thirds of both houses of Congress and three-quarters of the states. Since 1791, the Constitution has been amended only 17 times, and two of those were to create and then repeal prohibition. There needs to be something in between 17 times since 1791 and the large number that occurs there. Interestingly, the framers worried that they were making it too easy to amend the Constitution. Under the Articles of Confederation that preceded it, it took unanimous consent of the states to amend the Constitution. And they thought that maybe this was too easy. We know that it's too difficult. Um, so I'll choose something in between if I can rewrite the Constitution. Got it. 
Uh, why can't all states do what Nebraska and Maine do, allocate electoral votes by congressional district? Not perfect, but close to voting by popular vote. They can, but they never will for the reasons I alluded to, because it would seem is unilateral disarmament. Imagine you're the California legislature. Democrats control both houses. If they were to create representation in that way, they would be giving some of California's electors to the Republican candidate for president. If Texas were to do that, it would be giving some of Texas electors to the Democratic candidate for president. Neither California nor Texas will do this unless they were both to do it. It's what's often called a collective action problem. That's why the solution, I think, has to come from Congress. Congress could say, for the entire country, electors should be allocated by who wins in the congressional district or some form of proportional representation. It would greatly reduce the likelihood of the Electoral College choosing the loser of the popular vote as president of the United States. Uh, other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Yes, um, thank you again so much for this presentation. When you talk about what would excite the American people to change the current form of government, I look at Ukraine and how the men are fighting, the women left to take care of the families, etc. It's a very dynamic effort. In the United States, I worry that Americans are lazy and that if we had a similar situation here, people would not want to contribute to the war effort. How do we deal with Americans not being lazy and wanting a autocratic leader to do their job for them? Thank you. I don't think I accept the premise that the American people overall are lazy. I think that the difference in Ukraine, it was an existential threat to the existence of that country, that we all believed that there was a possibility that Ukraine would stop existing because of a Russian takeover relatively soon into the war. We haven't faced, thankfully, that kind of existential threat. Maybe 9-11 was as close as we came, and the country really did unify then. So I don't think it's about laziness. I think people often act out of self-interest, and our self-interest hasn't required that we take the kind of actions, thankfully, that they had to deal with in, in Ukraine. Uh, I'd like to go back for just a Please. moment to your succession of changes over time that have brought about the crisis. We didn't really talk about the media, communication, right. social media. You mentioned deep fakes and, and so on. So how, has the, how have the developments in that whole area affected the situation? And there is a chapter in the book that talks about the way in which the internet and social media are also a threat to democracy. I think that the internet and social media have contributed to the polarization within the United States. I think that the development of movies and then radio and then television had a remarkable unifying effect in the country. It really did give us a common culture and there was a time when people all got their news, no matter where they lived, from Walter Cronkite or Huntley and Brinkley. But then what's happened now is that people get the news that reinforces what they already believe. If you're conservative, you probably watch Fox News. If you're liberal, you probably watch MSNBC. And this didn't begin with the internet and social media. I think talk radio presaged what I'm talking about. But I can show you all sorts of statistics about how this contributes to polarization. I worry in terms of the internet and social media, in terms of the way in which they facilitate false speech, deep fakes being an example of that, the way in which they facilitate foreign influence on in our election. We saw that in 2016. And this is, for this part of the 21st century, a real contributor to the threat to democracy. Okay, other questions? Yes, sir. Um, your proposed reforms for the Senate and the Electoral College um, to align them more with the popular vote, what would prevent that from succumbing to the tyranny of the ma majority? Um, and there are, we've had a lot of speakers here, Francis Fukuyama, 
Batya Ungar Sargon talking about how the real schism is between the elites and the working class. And I think that would just make the working class even more disaffected than they already are. I think we have other checks, and in any new constitution should continue to have checks against the tyranny of the majority. There's the checks that come from separation of powers, and I would hope a new constitution would keep it. In fact, I think that one of the genius aspects of the Constitution is supposed to take two branches of government to do anything. We've developed, especially since 1787, much stronger cultural commitment to individual rights and a vastly stronger commitment to equal protection. These are checks against tyranny of the majority. Let me focus on the Electoral College. I can't see how the Electoral College choosing the loser of the popular vote is a check on tyranny of the majority. In fact, I can't think of any concept of democracy that tells us that it's better to have the person who loses the popular vote win because of the Electoral College. I don't think that eliminating the Electoral College would in any way cause those who are disaffected to be more disaffected. I think it would mean that every person's vote counts equally. In terms of the United States Senate, I'm skeptical that two senators per state and Wyoming getting the same number of states as California is somehow a check on the tyranny of the majority. I like the idea of both a House and a Senate, but I think they should both be allocated based on population. And I don't think doing that makes tyranny any more likely. We need to get a mic down in the front here. Oh, yes, sir. And then these folks down here as well. There are a lot of forces for which our current dysfunction is very beneficial for uh, foreign governments, very rich people. Um, do you talk at all about how we can combat some of that in today without things like constitutional amendments and whatnot? I'm going to take an example, and that's the problem with regard to campaign finance because the ability of corporations and wealthy people to spend unlimited amounts of money to get the candidates they want elected or defeated does breed cynicism with regard to the political system, and it does lead to the problems that you identified. Now, the Supreme Court's decisions from Citizen United onward could be overturned by constitutional amendment, but I actually think there are many things that could be done to reform the campaign finance system without needing a constitutional amendment. We could have far stronger disclosure laws to get rid of dark money in elections. We could say that corporations that do business with the level of government can't spend money to elect candidates for that level of government. We already have a law at the federal government, the Hatch Act, that says that civil service workers can't get involved politically. Well, likewise, I'd say corporations that do business with the federal government shouldn't be able to get involved politically. These are just a couple of examples, more, but the point is, I think there are things that could be done without constitutional amendment to reform our campaign finance system. And those would be? Well, I mentioned a couple. I mentioned disclosure laws. I mentioned restrictions on allowing a corporation or a union to give money if it's doing business with that level of government. So a Hatch Act for exactly. corporations. Um, let me ask one other question. I have been very heartened to see a lot of young people here in the Bay Area get involved in politics these la this last year or two. It's as though the dysfunction has really inspired some young people. These are 20-somethings, 30-somethings, running for local office. I know a young city councilman in Los Gatos, for instance. A number of them went to the Democratic Convention they are so idealistic, so determined to be productive and, and positive and you know, help us have a functioning system. Do you see that as being inspiring or will it be nullified by the structural issues that, that you see this? Absolutely, yes, I find it inspiring. One of the questions that I often get is, what gives me hope for the future? And my answer is, my students, they are so idealistic, they are so committed to trying to reform the system. And yet, when you look at opinion polls, one out of five who are in the 20s and 30s 
believe that dictatorship under some circumstances is a desirable form of government. When you talk to my students, you get the sense that they're so discouraged about the Supreme Court and the future of constitutional law. When you look at opinion polls, you see that the least level of confidence in the future of government is those in their 20s and 30s. So I'm inspired by those you describe and those that I see, but also concerned by what I see. So where is the reform effort going to come from? I mean, is it young folks like this? Is it existing members of Congress? I mean, who can, who can take the bull by the horns and make some of this change happen? Yes, is the answer to your question. I think it will come from young people. I think young people are a real force for change. We've seen that historically. But it also has to come from people of all ages, from all of us to say, there's a real serious problem facing American democracy, and we need to work for solutions. All right, I know there are other questions here in front. Yes, ma'am. So I, if you channel your inner current day Republican, I, I agree with everything you've said. The problem is I'm you can looking, stop there. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for some hope because there, you know, if you if you were a Republican, what could anyone ever say to persuade you to get rid of gerrymandering the Electoral College? They're set with the Supreme Court for decades, as you've pointed out. I mean, what what's you know, if you're in debate club, what <laughs> how could anyone convince you as a Republican to change? I think it has to appeal to our shared concern for the future of democracy. Let me take the Electoral College as an example. If John Kerry had won in 2004, though he lost the popular vote, I think there would have then been bipartisan support for changing the Electoral College. Now the Electoral College is perceived as favoring Republicans, so much harder to change. But somehow if we could convince people that the Electoral College well, in the long term, necessarily favor Republicans over Democrats. If we convince people that the Electoral College is inconsistent with the most basic sense of democracy, maybe we could have changed. We take the rules of the filibuster. The filibuster doesn't necessarily favor Republicans over Democrats. The filibuster favors whoever is the minority political party. But the filibuster contributes so much to the gridlock that keeps the federal government from acting. Maybe we could have an agreement between Republicans and Democrats that starting five years from now, 10 years from now, not knowing who's going to be the majority and who's going to be the minority, will eliminate the filibuster. Partisan gerrymandering helps if it's a Republican majority in the state legislature, but also helps if there's a Democratic majority in the state legislature. Right now, 26 states have a Republican majority, 24 have a Democratic majority. Well, maybe we could persuade Congress to say, not knowing what it's going to be in two or four years, pass a law that prohibits gerrymandering for congressional elections. Appeal to the common shared goal of saving democracy. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I, I see that, that there are a lot of things in the Constitution that, um, or at least in our history by gentlemen's agreement, that are just falling apart in terms of that we're not willing, based on party, to enforce those rules. And so the problem that, that I mean, I've seen in the last decade or so, and especially in the last couple administrations is that the courts or whatever or if the administration is willing to just thumb their nose at at precedent or whatever that there's no real enforcement mechanism and so if we don't agree to play by all the same rules um i don't see what the solution is there it's all it's all become whether it's my party or the other party and that determines whether lawmakers are willing to do sort of what they're supposed to do. They're not stepping up and they're not following, they're not playing by the same rules in the same game. So it's, it's a, I, agree I don't know what the weakness you. is there. Democracy requires that those in power follow norms. Let me give you an example of this that supports what you say. Up until 2016, whenever there'd been a vacancy on the Supreme Court in an election year, the president was able to pick and almost without exception, the Senate confirmed, sometimes they'd reject, but they would always take an action. Um, in 1956, Dwight Eisenhower in October, just weeks before the election, nominated a candidate for the Supreme Court and that person got confirmed. In 2016, for the first time, when Antonin Scalia died on February 13th 
and Barack Obama named Chief Judge Merrick Garland to replace him, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said, no hearings, no vote. He said a lame duck president shouldn't pick someone for the Supreme Court. That had never happened before. In September of 2020, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. One would think if a lame duck president shouldn't pick someone for the court, wait till after the election. That's what Mitch McConnell said in 2016. Instead, they rushed through Amy Coney Barrett, confirmed just days before the election. That's just inconsistent with norms that have been followed. And I give many other examples of that. What you're saying is part of why I believe there's such a crisis facing democracy, that we have to find a way for the norms to be followed even when they're unwritten. You give another example. Precedent, stare decisis, the idea that the Supreme Court will give great weight to precedent. And yet the court in recent years has just ignored precedent in case after case, including most notably, overruling Roe versus Wade. And the only reason they did so is it's a majority that disagrees with the earlier decision of the court. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Well, thank you for this vibrant discussion. I was wondering if you could tell us what would be the mechanism to force the Supreme Court, A, to have some ethics, and B, to, to not voluntarily, but to be forced to have term limits. Okay. There are two different questions there, and the mechanism is different for each. In terms of ethics, I believe that Congress could pass an ethics code for the Supreme Court, and Congress could create an enforcement mechanism. Now, I've heard some say, well, wouldn't that threaten the independence of the court? Independence of the judiciary means the ability of judges to decide cases based on their best views of the law and the fact. Having an ethics code doesn't in any way compromise the decisional independence of the Supreme Court. Congress already regulates many aspects of the institution of the court. Congress sets the number of Supreme Court justices. Congress sets the budget for the Supreme Court. Congress sets the salary of Supreme Court justices. Ask yourself the following question. Can Congress pass a law to make it a crime to bribe a Supreme Court justice? The answer to that has to be yes. And so that says, of course, Congress can pass an ethics code. Until last November, every other judge in the country state and federal, was bound by an ethics code, other than the most important judges, Supreme Court justices. And I think that's contributed to the low approval ratings of the Supreme Court. And that was a self-inflicted wound. So the Supreme Court grudgingly adopts an ethics code. And if you read the preface to it, it even sounds grudging, saying, we don't really need this. This is just confirming what we already do. But it's a weakened ethics code, a watered-down version of what applies to other judges. For other judges, when there's a conflict of interest, it says the judge shall be disqualified. The Supreme Court Ethics Code says the Supreme Court justice should be disqualified. Shall in the law is mandatory. Should is more aspirational. But even worse, there's no enforcement mechanism in the Supreme Court's Ethics Code. It, there's an afterword to it which says this is still left to each justice to decide for himself or herself whether to be disqualified in a case. No one should be a judge of himself or herself. There are a lot of ways of creating an enforcement mechanism. My colleague, former federal judge Jeremy Fogel, in testimony before the Senate Judiciary said, Congress should create a panel of retired Federal Court of Appeals judges, and they should rule on the recusal motions. Justice Kagan indicated she might support that in a speech in Sacramento last month. So my answer to your first question is Congress could pass an ethics code and create an enforcement mechanism. And this shouldn't be partisan. Ethics for Supreme Court justices apply the same whether it's a conservative or a liberal. The latter question you asked, though, is about term limits. I think that would take a constitutional amendment, certainly to apply to current justices. It's always been understood that when someone's confirmed for the Supreme Court, the position is his or hers for life unless the person to resign or be impeached and removed. But this is a place where I said in response to your question that I think there's a plausible chance of a constitutional amendment for term limits because Republicans have supported it and it's got overwhelming support from the people. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. <clears throat> what uh, continues to amaze me is the amount of money 
that is spent on our electoral system. I mean, just in the past two weeks, $540 million was made. It's crazy. Do you support an idea where we could just compress the election into maybe a three-month period and thereby eliminate the, um, you might say, money buys the power? In a way, that's what we've done this year, is compress it into three yeah, months. Unintentionally. Um, unintentional. Um, I don't think compressing it in three months will decrease the amount of money. I fear that it may even increase the amount of money. Um, I think that there are other systems that could, though they likely require overruling Citizens United. I think limiting the expenditures that people and corporations can make in an election would decrease the amount of money. I think that if we went to a true public funding system for elections, which I think would be desirable, would decrease the amount of money. Um, I think the Supreme Court has made so many mistakes with regard to campaign finance. I think in 1976, the Supreme Court said, spending money in elections is speech protected by the First Amendment. I think that takes a figurative expression, money talks far too literally. <laughs> Giving money is a form of conduct that may communicate a message, but it's not speech. The Supreme Court saying that there can't be any limits on expenditures, I think contributes to the problem. The Supreme Court saying corporations can spend money out of corporate treasuries contributes to the problem. The Supreme Court refusing to allow public funding systems that have a realistic effect contributes to the problem. So I think I can come up with solutions. I'm just not sure a three-month campaign would mean less money is spent. So there are some other interesting models in the world of countries that have place limits on the time length of campaigns as well as campaign financing and even had, have a quiet period leading up to in the last week of the election or whatever, no ads, et cetera. What other countries do you think are doing a good job on this? I think that with regard to the election systems, here I'd point to some of the countries people have talked about, some of the Scandinavian countries. Um, it's interesting, Canada has many ways a political system like ours, but you don't see the corrosive effect of campaign finance spending in Canada that you do in this country. But I think what you describe would be struck down by the Supreme Court. If Congress were to say, no advertising for a political candidate the week before the election, that would be deemed a restriction on speech that would never be upheld. So I think there's a lot of agreement in this room, at least, um, and enriched by your book about the necessity of some of these steps. Where does it start? How, how, does, how does the ball get rolling to take any of these actions? I know this is gonna sound overly simplistic, but it really starts with all of us. I mean, what we need to do if we care about these changes is get involved in the organizations that are working for them. There are organizations right now that are working for, say, term limits for Supreme Court justices. I think it's called Reform the Court, and there's some other organizations in D.C. that are working for that. There are organizations that are working for electoral college reform, and I can go on with the list. We all have much more impact when we're working with others, and so getting involved in the organizations that are pushing the reforms we care about is the way to do that. It's not gonna happen on its own, and this goes to some of the questions. It's not gonna happen if we leave it to other people because everyone will leave it to somebody else. But there are organizations and we can work together for them if we decide to do so. Do you have a few favorites that you can name other than reform the court? Um, well, they're the familiar ones. I mean, if you care about civil liberties issues, the ACLU is the preeminent organization. If you care about civil rights issues, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund or the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, the Anti-Defamation League are all organizations. And the danger of my saying it is, if people hear or people are watching, they say, but you didn't mention my organization. <laughs> and of course, I've just given examples. There's so many terrific organizations working um, for political reform. The League of Women Voters does great work. Common Cause does work on many of these issues. Um, 
So these are terrific organizations, and so many I didn't mention, but that we all can get involved in, and we don't have to get involved on the same issue, the same organization. It's the issues that we care about. We can get involved with the organizations working for those changes. Other audience questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, both of you have referred to the discussions that need to happen to create a movement that's strong enough to really cause reform. And in, in the last part of your book, you urge us all to initiate and be involved in those discussions. My concern is when we just focus on individual issues and individual organizations, we will so diffuse the energy that none of these will really happen. There are only so many progressives, I'll use the short term, only so many progressives that are actively involved that we divide our energies among so many issues that nothing really happens. That's my biggest concern. So how do we have discussions about fundamental, comprehensive political reform? And how do we have those discussions over the next four years where we appear to have some opportunity for broader discussion in society? I think it's a great question and I don't have a good answer to it. And what I would say in that regard is the first step is we have to admit there's a serious problem that needs to be solved. And without recognizing the existence of a problem, we'll never work for a solution. Second, we need to try to think about where is a solution most plausible in the short term? and to pick issues where, and maybe it is, if there's, I'm gonna make this up, a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress, to get adopted a Voting Rights Act, and a Voting Rights Act that could do such things as eliminate partisan gerrymandering for congressional elections, a Voting Rights Act that would overturn Shelby County versus Holder and create a preclearance procedure, a Voting Rights Act that would overcome some of the other undesirable Supreme Court decisions that have gutted the Voting Rights Act. And that might be a place where we really could do something as a start. In the prior session of Congress, it passed the House of Representatives, a couple of bills that had done so many of these things and more. And then it went to the Senate, and there was an effort to try to eliminate the filibuster just for voting rights legislation, rather than take on abolish the filibuster altogether, get this through by eliminating the filibuster for that kind of legislation. And the Senate could do that. But two senators, Manchin and Cinema, made clear that they would not go along with changing Senate filibuster rules. Maybe a different Senate, starting in January of 2025, might be willing to do that. But if you ask me where to start, Start with what we can accomplish, and then we can take on the larger issues. Any more questions from the audience? Yes, sir. So uh, one of the problems seems to be too much money, and we talk about changing the numerator, but what about changing the denominator? I mean, England has 50% more members of the parliament than, and yeah. one-fifth the population. Could we have a Politburo of 20,000 reps and the money would be divided in smaller amounts? I'd say 20,000 reps is too many, just like the number of amendments that was mentioned is too many. But one of the things that I talk about in the book, relatively briefly, is the need to increase the size of the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives has been 435 since the 1920s. The population has grown enormously over the last century. Increasing the size of the House of Representatives would make it more democratic. The fewer people someone represents, the more that they feel that they are being heard. It would also help solve the problems in the Electoral College, because remember, the number of electors in a state is the sum of its representatives plus senators. So if we gave California more representatives given its population, but didn't do that for Wyoming, we'd help solve that problem. This can be done by Congress by statute. Doesn't take a constitutional amendment, doesn't take a new constitution. The number in the House of Representatives is not a magical number. Now, I don't know what's the ideal number and we can argue over it. I doubt we'll ever find an ideal number, but we could significantly increase the House and decrease some of the problems that I've described. 
We are at the end of our time, yes. unfortunately. Uh, our great thanks to Dean Chemerinsky, author of No Democracy Lasts Forever, How the Constitution Threatens the United States. Thank you for helping us stare at the abyss thank and you. think about- Thank you. And think about how to step back from it. Please pick up a copy of Dr. Uh, Dr. Chemerinsky's book here or at your local bookstore. Thank you so much to our very participatory audience here, to those watching online. Uh, please join if you're not a club member. We do this all the time. Next month, Jane, uh, Jane Goodall on her 90th birthday talking about climate change. Many great programs coming up. Please join us uh, on our website uh, for upcoming programs uh, and for uh, your participation today, your membership and support. We're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.